Bit crushing is a way of emulating what would have happened to our signal had we recorded it in a lower sample rate or bit depth. Now, most of the time, as we spoke about with audio recording, we want to record in it at a higher sample rate and bit depth as we possibly can to make sure that the sound that gets transcribed from the original analog signal is as accurate as possible. Remember that we talk about sample rate in hertz and it's how many times per second there is a sort of plot point digitally for what is happening to that real analog wave. Let's jump in to uh, our bit crushing effect so that we can talk as we go. First things first, let's get rid of camel crusher because we don't really want to have chains of effects when we're learning about what each individual one does as it all confuses as to what's really happening with the sound. So down here again, click on here to insert an effect and our bit crusher is called Time Machine. So let's double click on that and here we are. Now Time Machine's got a, a few dials as you can see and the big one is the uh, resample rate. Remember that uh, 44.1 kilohertz is the same sample rate that digital audio is at for exporting to CD. Uh, due to some clever maths, 44.1 kilohertz is, is basically the limit as to what we can hear as people. And the reason why we use 44.1 is because using much, much more is still very expensive to to do but the reason we don't use less is because we can basically afford not to however that wasn't the case maybe even as little as 10 years ago when a lot of equipment used lower than 44.1 uh, kilohertz for sample rate and lower than 16 bits for bit depth and that uh, in, in a lot of ways that that cost saving measure actually created a lot of the character of music from everywhere from the late 80s all the way through the 90s and even into the 2000s. So let's take a listen to what happens when we cut down the uh, the sample rate of this loop. So we're at 44.1 at the moment because everything is 16 here and 44.1 here and we haven't got anything changed on the dial. Essentially this isn't doing anything to the sound right now. So. Here we go. Now, as we drop down this sample rate, what we're going to do is essentially, um, if this sound is a join the dots puzzle, at the moment every dot is very close to each other so we can get a very detailed representation. As we drop down this sample rate, we're essentially rubbing out some of the dots in that join the dots puzzle so we get less and less accurate and it gets more and more difficult to see what the original picture was. Okay, so as you can hear, we just get um, distorted. It sounds more and more like computer bleeps that are doing the same kind of thing as the original, as it does a real electric piano. Now, the more sound you have running through uh, a, a resampler, the more quickly it will become apparent that you're losing accuracy because obviously the more sound that you've got, the more you need accuracy. Um, but by the time we got certainly to below uh, 8 kilohertz, we really could tell that we were losing out. Compare this to the, the amount of bit depth. Bit depth is all about how much accuracy the difference between loud and quiet can be transcribed in digital audio. So when we talk about bit depth, we talk about it in bits. Um, and because bits are binary figures, 16 bit is 2 to the power of 16, which ends up with somewhere in the region of 65,000, I believe, which means that there are 65,000 points at which the difference between no volume at all and zero decibels, the most volume that we can get, can be transcribed. So as we cut that down, we start to get less and less accuracy of our harmonics as well. So let's try that. So as you can hear, it gets noisy. And then as we go down and down,
you might notice that that sounds quite similar to when we were doing our overdrive distortion and that is for a very good reason. If you consider that what's happening when we crunch down the amount of bits, i.e. the amount of difference between loud and quiet that can be accurately uh, told back to our digital to analog part of the signal chain, what we're doing is creating much, much less in the way of uh, dynamic accuracy. When we push an overdriven signal really, really hard, what we're essentially doing there as well is cutting out the dynamics of the signal as well, because things are either, as we go harder and harder, either off or essentially as loud as each other. So the reason we get that overdriven sound when we drop the bits down is because whilst it's not doing exactly the same thing, we're getting some of the same effect. Now, combining bit depth and sample rate is the surefire way to be able to dial in exactly the same kind of sound that you want. And it's important to note that just looking at the fact that, I don't know, say for instance, the MPC 60 uh, that uh, DJ Premier swears by and still uses to this day is a 12 bit sampler. And I, I think it's uh, I think it's 31 or it might be 40 uh, kilohertz. It's not quite 44.1 um, and certain other instruments like the Boss SP303 have much, much lower bit depth and sample rates. Just dialing in that number won't give you exactly the same sound. It's much more a case of listening. So if we drop down as we go, maybe drop down here and then we compare this to when it's turned off. So to, to bypass something, don't forget, we can either come down to it on the insert, right click and bypass the effects, or, or in each effects window, we can just tap this tick. So you can see when it's turned between on and off very quickly, just how much accuracy we are losing by cutting down the bit depth and the sample rate. Another way that we can change the accuracy further is with the aliasing that we've got here. I say accuracy, I think it's the perceived accuracy is probably a more accurate way of saying it. We've got AD aliasing and DA aliasing, and uh, remember that's analog to digital and digital to analog aliasing. And aliasing is the uh, phenomenon by which, um, I guess, visible steps occur between different points. If we turn up the aliasing, what we do is we get rid of, um, I guess, a smartness to a converter, whereby between, say, two or three points, rather than trying to figure out how to as smoothly as possible travel between those points as aliasing goes up and up and up we just get to the point where we're just adding things on almost like lego bricks so it uh, it it's a way or anti-aliasing is a way of smoothing out those digital steps and it makes a big difference if we listen to what happens when we turn this up and uh, especially now if we also turn up our digital to analog aliasing, we'll really get that almost computer gamey sound. Okay. And you can hear just how accurate that is. Compare that to off. And we get that. Uh, that nice digital sound and it might be something that you want to put on almost everything you do because you're so influenced by that uh, that classic sound where things had to sound like this or it might be something that you use sparingly if at all we've got uh, just three more things before we move off from time machine and we've got a high pass filter uh, because if you remember that uh, bass frequencies have a lot of um, energy in them using uh, dropping the sample rate down will have a big effect on how the bass sounds, probably just as much as anything else. So dropping the sub -resume. So you can hear just how much character is in there as we come up to a thousand hertz, which is kind of the, uh, the, the, I guess the midpoint of what we hear. And we'll, if you've not looked at our EQing section yet, we'll, Make sure that you understand that by the time we're finished. 
The last two things we need to look at are here, these two buttons that are Dithering and uh, Mulot. Now, once again, these are things that we'll take a quick look at when we get into our final mixing and exporting stage, but very quickly, Dithering is essentially a way of adding a mathematically calculated uh, but almost imperceptibly small amount of noise to a signal. And what that noise does is helps just to uh, smooth off the edges, almost like um, just wetting the edges of a watercolour, just to help things sound a little bit like they fit together. It takes out, to an extent, some of the accuracy, but if there have been inaccuracies generated by the way that something's done, such as poor uh, quality sampling, then it's perhaps better to smooth out some of that inaccuracy and be left with, with some of the more smoother sounds. And uh, Mulor is just a way of looking at how that sampling works. It's a very mathematical um, way of looking at how digital information is transcribed. And you might not hear a great deal of difference if we try. There's a very, very, very small difference when we do our dithering. If we change, if we turn on Mulor as a sampling uh, law. You can hear that, or if you can hear, there's very little difference. But if you do have a specific thing that you're trying to get hold of, it might be worth experimenting with them. Okay, so that is basically what we need to look at for our two types of distortion. We've got our overdrive distortion and our, our bit crushing distortion. And the important thing is that you remember that as long as you're not distorting on the channel fader, then all you have to worry about is whether it sounds good or not. So be subtle or be outright crazy, stack effects up, do other things to the signal chain but just focus on whether you like the sound or not. Okay, well have fun.